God speaks to us. And how does he speak to us? Through sacred scripture. So God is, is it's a revealed religion. In other words, like I told you, it's Sunday Mass. The reason you know my name, the reason I know your name, is because you told me your name. And you might have to tell me a few times. You know. But God is revealing himself to us through his sacred scripture. But it's very important for us to understand it. Through sacred scripture. It is very important for us to understand that God reveals himself to us also through sacred tradition, right? Okay. So it is an example of getting from home. It is a good idea, isn't it, to celebrate Christmas? I mean, not that Christmas is mentioned in the Bible per se, Christmas. But it's good that we should celebrate the nativity of our Savior who ushers in humanity, who ushers in salvation for us. So it's a good thing to celebrate Christmas. Would you not all agree? How we celebrate Christmas, though, is, you know, just a matter of tradition. Like, some people do certain things, others do others. And some of those things are written down and some of them aren't. Like, you can write down a recipe. It's awesome. Write down a recipe. It's great. But sometimes you don't write down a recipe. Like what I told y'all we did on Christmas morning. Well, actually, it might have been a little late on Christmas morning. It might, might have gone smidge into the afternoon. But it was probably, it was sometime late morning. Where mom sat us down in a special living room where we, where we were never allowed in the living room. I mean, we had a room that was not ever used. We don't know why, but it was the living room. And there was furniture that was also never used. But anyway, <laughs> and so she sat in a special chair, and it was a lovely little armchair, because she was a little lady. And she read to us, what, one solitary life. And guess what every member of my family does on Christmas? We read all of us. One solitary life. It's, I mean, it, it, do we have to? It's a, matter of, a family tradition. So God is revealing himself to us through sacred scripture, but also through sacred tradition. Clearly, the Bible is in some ways part of sacred tradition, isn't it? Because the Bible, as a, as a book, per se, wasn't compiled until the church didn't compile the Bible until the late 300s. There was no Bible, per se, 73 books until the church approved which books they would be, right? That's part of sacred tradition. The Bible did not fall from heaven. It took the church as, as the teaching body to, in the Council of Rome in like 383, in the Council of Hippo and Carthage, which followed in 383, 387, 389, something like that. Um, so those councils compiled the Bible as we know it in 73 books. Um, there's, there's, in no book of the Bible is there a table of contents. Is there? Yeah. So the church had to figure out what the table of contents was. In other words, what books would be accepted as the canon of sacred scripture, the 73 books, and what wouldn't, right? Okay, so it was the church that, again, through various councils, we were councils, the Pope or his delegate and the bishops of the church, who were the official teachers, aren't they? And so the church had to compile that book. And so that's really important that he comes to understand uh, that it's a matter of not, it, it's a matter of looking at something wider than how I can proofread a particular text from the scripture. Okay. So that brings us to uh, the, the, the very important things that he began to learn at the University of Notre Dame. The first thing. What was the first thing that Dr. Petrie learned at Notre Dame, the University of Notre Dame University, that changed the way he would see Mary? And that's middle, middle top of page nine. First, I learned that the Catholic belief about Mary are deeply rooted in ancient Christianity. Okay. So in other words, the early church, we know, believed in the perpetual virginity of Mary. How do we know this? There are certain men called the followers of the church who were preached to by the apostles. And, and they handed on the apostolic faith to the early church. So, believing the perpetual virginity of Mary, or her sinlessness, or identity as a mother of God, or her powerful intercession, is what the church believed in, in the Holy Land, in Syria, in Egypt, in Greece, in Asia Minor, in Rome. In short, they were part and parcel of the Christian faith. That's very important. The second thing that he learned is that uh, he gradually came to understand that these ancient Christian beliefs about Mary flowed directly about what Christians 
um, come to understand about Jesus. Okay, so right there from the Catechism, what the Catholic faith believes about Mary is based on what it believes about Christ, and what it teaches about Mary illuminates in turn its faith in Christ. So, any teachings that seem anti-biblical or contra Bible really reflect what we believe about Jesus. For instance, if we believe that Mary was conceived immaculately, the Immaculate Conception, if we believe that Mary was conceived immaculately, the Immaculate Conception, why would it be that Mary would must be conceived in her mother's womb without the transmission of original sin? Okay, so at, 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 um, at, uh, at Manresa, in every room in Manresa, there is a bottle of hand sanitizer. There wasn't a bottle of hand sanitizer before March of 2020, I think, sure. I mean, you know, as I told you, we should have gone into the business of buying stock and Lysol, or whoever makes this stuff. But I mean, even, even I have a bottle of hand sanitizer in my car, you know? I mean, you go get your gas or whatever, you, you wash your hands. Why? Because, you know, the hand is a great transmitter of germs, which cause us to get colds and flu and other things which we don't want, right? In other words, we want to be free of those illnesses, even the ones that aren't going to kill us. We want to be free of because nobody wants a cold, right? If, in fact, therefore... Mary was chosen by God. See, what I'm trying to say to you is what the second thing you learned is what we believe about Mary, the Immaculate Conception, has everything to do with what we believe about Jesus. So if she was chosen from early, from, from her conception to be the mother of Jesus, who is God, and God is holy, right? Is God holy? Yes. Is God holy, holy? Yes. Is God holy, holy, holy? Yes. Remember, as I've taught you before, the reason we say holy, holy, holy is because in, in Hebrew, there is no adjective holy, comparative holier, superlative holiest. The reason we say God is in the, from the Old and New Testament, the angels are singing holy, 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 is we're, we're saying God is the holiest. And if God is the holiest, he cannot dwell in a sinful vessel. So the reason we teach Mary's Immaculate Conception is why? Because we believe that she is the son, mother of the all-holy God. So what he learned, the second thing he learned is what we believe about Mary speaks to us of what we actually believe about Jesus. Okay? That's the second thing that he learns uh, that was very important. Um, Oh, by the way, why the perpetual virginity? Again, strange teaching, right? Why the perpetual? It, again, it's all about Jesus, okay? If Jesus is the Son of God, and she conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit, my grandmother and my mother did not get married again because they had been fellow. I'm not saying that women and men shouldn't get married after the spouse dies, but well, let me put you this way. Once you've been with the Holy Spirit, no other guy seems gay. <laughs> I mean, you know, you're not going to have relations with a man when you conceive, when you have conceived a child by the power of the Holy Spirit. So her perpetual virginity speaks to her singular vocation as to be the mother of the all-holy God. You know, so that's why we teach the, why, why the perpetual virginity is so important. Considering that, you can imagine St. Joseph. St. Joseph says, I ain't touching her. <laughs> I know. Why? Because he knows that she has been impregnated by the Holy Spirit. And that's since she has a spousal relationship with God. She's not God. But she has that spousal relationship. Keeping in mind that in the ancient world, when you had sex with a man, you were married. You were married. You had sex with a man. So you were already married. 
So the perpetual virginity of Mary, she understood her single vocation, and St. Joseph clearly understood his single vocation as to, you know, letting her be who she was called to be. Uh, quick question. Of course. Does that mean that Joseph and Mary did not have relations? We're not married. That's a great. Joey, you are. Joey's back. Joey was great in RCIA. Uh, he asked the best questions. Okay. Very good question. Uh, it was not sexually consummated, but they were, in fact, betrothed. Okay. And that's a great question. Thank you for asking you, Joey. So in the ancient world, in the ancient Jewish world, one was betrothed, in that sense, married by consent. And so you, you didn't necessarily live with your betrothed. So that's why we say they were married while well, they didn't live together. They lived together in the same house, but they lived together in a chaste way. They were betrothed. In the ancient Jewish world, in fact, engagement was betrothal. And it might take a long time to marry that person. I mean, because those marriages were arranged. Okay, thank you for asking. It's a great question. And I think you asked it for a good reason. In other words, you wanted me to explain that, which I appreciate very much. Uh, so anyway, the Archbishop was the former Archbishop got this, and so it was burying my mother. The bishop always buries the mother of the priest, always does the wedding mass, the funeral mass of the mother of the priest. And uh, he uh, began to preach at my mother's mass. Now, my mother worked for him in his home. When, when Daddy had to retire because he had a stroke, um, my mother looked at him and after a little while of him being home. He just worked six days a week his entire life. And never took a vacation, worked six days a week. And she looked at Daddy and she said, Honey, I'm going to, I'm going to get a job and we're getting divorced. Because <laughs> <laughs> they never spent that much time together. So there used to be a job called the Major Domo of the Bishop's House. And it was when the Bishop's House had many priests living there, like half a dozen priests. And they had uh, three cooks and two housekeepers and a laundress. And Mama was really a special person in the home, and so she, you know, prepared the meals, and uh, she didn't prepare the meals, she, she uh, planned the meals, and, and gave the cooks great recipes, and she was just a perfect for it. She worked about 16 hours a week. She got out of the house, thank God, then just wanted to watch the Rays and the Cubs, you know? <laughs> and she hated baseball. She really did. So Archbishop knew my mother very, very well, and um, he began to preach her funeral, <laughs> and he said, well, you know, Sam and Julia, had an arranged marriage. And uh, it was from, from their days in Lebanon or something crazy like that. They were both born in the United States. And everybody on both sides of the family are like, what is he saying? <laughs> he never had an arranged marriage at all. So the Archbishop told me how to body serve in the Gulf of Mexico. I had a really close relationship with him. He was like a priest, like the priest used to be, take him out for dinner and take him take to the Gulf and to the night hotel. It was so much fun. We swam, I swam with the Archbishop all 12 months out of here in the Gulf of Mexico. Even when it was real cold. It used to be a uh, holiday in down in West Beach. And uh, we, it was called, the, they had a holiday where you could swim in a deep pool. And if you ever want a fantastic um, sensation, go into the Gulf when the Gulf is 59, 60 degrees. And it's about 60 outside, maybe on a January day. And go in that water for about 20 minutes and go into a holiday in a heated pool. Wonderful. So the Archbishop did this very well. And I was like, I said to the Archbishop as, as gently as I could, I said, Archbishop, Mama and Daddy didn't have an arranged marriage. They had, I, 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 we all know the story. Your mother told me that. <laughs> I said, well, okay. Lo and behold, guess who had the arranged marriage? The other father's me. His parents. And I came to know that recently. Only recently, she would, Laura East got rest of soul, she was an absolute saint, Father Zabi's mother. She and, uh, she was like a very young girl, and she was in New Orleans, and uh, Anthony's, Father Anthony and Father Jimmy's um, father, his name is Herbert. Was Herbert? Yeah, Herbert was Herbert. They, they were like betrothed. I mean, that, that was the deal. They were going to get married. She was a very young girl, like 12 or 13, 14 years old. And he said, That's a girl I'm doing. You can't marry a 12 year old. <laughs> Not even whatever year they were married. So he got the wrong father's eye, is what I'm trying to say <laughs> about the truth. Okay? Um, yes. Yeah. You understand God and know how powerful and how holy God is. And Mary is like it. 
Well, that's the point. All, all the teachings, and to your point, Barbara, all the teachings relative to Mary that seem unbiblical are really teachings that reflect what we believe about Jesus. They're not about Mary any more than when I became devoted at 14 to the Blessed Mother. It didn't stop there. In an instant, I was coming to love Jesus. The, the Blessed Mother never wants us to be devoted to her without coming to adore her son. And so that's that's the point. Um, thank you, Barbara. Very well said. Okay. Uh, top of page 10. Therefore, in every chapter, before we look at Mary, we will uh, consider Jesus. What is the third thing that uh, Dr. Piku learned at Notre Dame that completely changed the way he saw Mary? Third and most important of all, I discovered that the ancient Christians got their beliefs about Mary from the Old Testament, not just the New Testament. In fact, they understood the understanding of what the Bible teaches about Mary can be found in what is called typology. In other words, Mary represents. When she's called woman, Jesus is a woman. What business of, that, of yours is that of mine? Well, he's really speaking about woman, Eve. She's the new Eve. So you have to understand the typology. Typology means Mary represents. Typology. Mary represents. She's a she, what was prefigured is fulfilled. So he calls her woman because he's speaking of the woman, Eve, who fell, and speaking about Mary, who kept God's word. I don't get it, but that, that will be done. And, you know, it was done. Then the Holy Spirit came down upon him. All right. The reason I think this is really important, I think we have, yeah, we have plenty of time, is that... Um, uh, um, uh, the, the, one of these professors points out that uh, evangelicals have much to learn. This is a particular Protestant minister who quotes Timothy George, a uh, Protestant theologian. Evangelicals have much to learn from reading about Mary against the background of the uh, Old Testament foreshadowings. The image of Mary in the New Testament is inseparable from the Old Testament antecedents, without which we are left with not only a reductionist view of Mary, but also of Christ. I, I think I need to I'm, I'm not, I, I'm not, I'm long removed from the seminary, which is why I get scared to teach in front of a guy that's in the middle of it right now. Anyway. <laughs> there was a fellow, and his name was Martian, and he wasn't from Mars. Okay. Martian, the reason we have these 73 books is really because of Martian. M-I-M-A-R-C-I-O-N. He was born in about 80, he lived for about 80 years, so 80 and 80 is one sixty. Right. He was a heretic. He was a heretic. He said that the God of the Old Testament was not the God of the New Testament. And because the God of the Old Testament was not the God of the New Testament, the, the Old Testament God was the vengeful God as opposed to the New Testament God who was the compassionate God, the loving God. He said he eschewed, or in his Martian Bible, there was no Old Testament. In the Martian Bible. So, you know, the church, it's kind of like you as parents. <laughs> when, you know, you have to make rules when the kids break the rules, right? Yeah. I mean, like the kids, like they stayed out till 2 in the morning, okay? Curfews at mid midnight here. Curfews at midnight, can't be out, out past midnight. Yeah, that skirt's too short. You gotta get that skirt down a bit. You know, so, because you break the rules. But the church has had to react to heretics. By stating the truth. So, there's a, for many decades, even centuries after Martian lived, there was no canon of sacred scripture. So, the reason I mention this is because the church had to condemn him because we believe that the 46 books of the Old Testament are as valid as the 26 book, 27 books of the New Testament. The Old Testament, 46 books, and the New Testament, 27 books, are as valid as each other. God inspired the 46 books. He really did. So just because you think that he's a God of venge, venge, vengeance, doesn't mean that you can dump the entire Old Testament. So that's when the church had to begin a real deep reflection upon what books would be in the Old Testament and what books would be in the New Testament. All right. You ready? All right. We're going to take about five minutes 
and we're going to talk to you about why we have what we have as far as 73 books. You ready? Okay. And you've learned this if you've done my RCIA, but you don't listen to me. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. So, the church in forming the Bible, again, not really in its present form until about 380. And with what's called the Council of Rome. Council of Rome. Oh, shucks. Uh, what's going on, John? I don't know. What's going on? Okay, I don't know. What's going on. <laughs> <laughs> don't use that again. You, you broke it. Whatever we use there, it won't right now. Yeah, that. It's called water. Huh? It's called water. Yeah, give me some more. Thank you. No, that's give me, water. That's give me a paper towel. Okay. Give me a paper towel. Thank you, John. Thank you, John. Um, okay. So the church is dealing with various collections of Old Testament scripture. And this is, again, informing the Bible. The church is dealing with at least two major collections of Old Testament scripture. Um, Okay. There's, we're talking about the Old Testament. Okay. <laughs> it's really important. Did you know you learn 70% more if you're seeing something? You learn 70% more if you're seeing something than just, yeah, thank you very much. Appreciate it. And I might need another marker if you have another marker. Thank you very much. Yeah, give me five. That'd be awesome. Thanks for trying. Yeah, this is gone. Okay, we killed it. Kill the marker. Oh Lord, bless this marker. Um, it's gone. If you can get me another one, I appreciate it. Alright, thank you. <laughs> Give me the holy oil splits on my heart. Alright, so this is important. So there are two collections where the church is coming up with what we call the 46 books of the Old Testament. In the ancient world, there were what's called the Antiochene collection from Antioch, Syria. Okay. There's the Alexandrian collection, which is from Alexandria, Egypt. Okay. The Antiochian collection is written in Hebrew. The Alexandrian collection is a translation from the Hebrew to Greek. The New Testament church, the ancient church, spoke Greek. Okay? So the church adopted the Greek collection, which has more books than the Alexandrian collection. Seven more. That's why the Protestant Bible has 66 books. We'll talk about why they did that. By the way, there was no Protestant Bible until the 1500s. Because there were no Protestants until the 1500s, right? All right? The reason I mention that is because it's a matter of linguistic affinity, which means, like, as a parish picnic, uh, this kid was uh, one of the boys I helped get ordained. Uh, uh, he said, uh, he was starting ministry in Spanish. He said, Is your parish united? Meaning, are the Hispanics and the Anglos united? I said, Heck no, my parish isn't united. Absolutely, it's completely divided into four parts five o'clock mass, eight o'clock mass, <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and you know, what I learned when I went to Rome, Italy is. You're going to school with people in class at the Jesuit, uh, Roman, at the Jesuit University. People speak like, they're in that room with 300 students, 275 students. They're speaking, I mean, they're no kidding. There's got to be 50 languages represented right there in that the university. Right. Thanks, John. Appreciate it. Really appreciate it. Thank you. So, thank you. Awesome. Thank you very much. Oh, that's awesome. Thank you very much. Okay. So, um, so I mentioned this, I'm going to put that down, the Antiochian collection, the Antiochian, Antioch, the Antioch collection, Antioch collection, which is in Hebrew, and the Alexandria collection, Alexandria, Alexandria, this is Syria, Antioch, Syria, and this is Alexandria, Egypt, okay, Egypt, and Greek, okay. The church adopted the Alexandria collection, which had 46 books. Okay? When I was in Rome studying theology, and you had a break, you had a 15-minute break between classes, 
The American, the English, the Irish, and the Scots all went down to the coffee shop and we talked English. All the boys from Latin America, they went to the coffee shop and they all talked Spanish. All the boys from Italy went to the coffee shop and they all spoke Italian. All the boys from Poland went to the coffee shop and they all spoke Polish. Because we naturally speak the language of, 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 our, of our growing up. You know? We had a lady who died, Jackie. And Jackie, the juvenile, could only pray certain prayers in France because she grew up somewhere in the United States as a kid where they only spoke French. Like her only spoke French. The one case in Louisiana. Point being, the reason we, we adopted the Alexandrian collection of 46 books is because of the church's affinity towards Greek. The New Testament is written in Greek. Okay? The church did not come up with this collection of sacred scripture until about three, there was a council called the council. And these councils are very important, by the way, because the church had to confront heresies. The first major council of the church, well, the first major council is basically the council of the apostles. When, 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 um, when Paul, when, when Peter's chickening out against the Jews, uh, who wanted the Christians not to eat meat and be circumcised, and Paul says, uh uh, uh, uh Jack, that ain't, that's not how we roll, man. You can eat anything you want. He said, the only thing you can't do is enter into unlawful marriages uh, or, or uh, eat, eat meat strangled. I don't know why meat strangled is a big deal, but it was a fairly big deal. And give them four. That was the three things that apostles set out. And then 3.25, the church said, we believe that Jesus is not just a man that God, the Council of Nicaea. But these three councils of Rome and Hippo and uh, Hippo was 380, I think 384, and Carthage was 387, I think, something like that. It was these three councils that came up with this book we call the Bible. And really it started as a reflection over about a 200 year period when Marchin got rid of the Old Testament. And this is very important because if we're going to look at Mary, not just through the lens of the New Testament, but through the lens of the Old Testament, we have to understand that God inspired the Old Testament as well as the New Testament. That's why I went through that whole thing about it. So if ever a person, I don't know that I could really say that I explained that very easily, but I did try to help you understand why we have a few more books in our Old Testament, the Catholic Old Testament, than our Protestant brothers and sisters do. Okay? Before I continue, any questions? Yes. Oh well, Jerome translated the Jerome trans Saint Jerome translated the Hebrew and the Greek into what's called Latin, which was the which became the language of the people. He translated it's called the Vulgate, which means the the yes the vulgar language. The language that's vulgar, which is Latin, meaning the language of the people. Okay, and if, and in my studies of Latin, I would have to agree that with Jerome, it was definitely Latin, it's definitely vulgar. <laughs> the hardest thing I've studied is Latin, God help. No. Father Jerome, Father uh, Gerald Heinemann said, when he, 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 I think I've told you all this story, but after 20 years, I guess I've told you every story, really. But uh, he, was, he was climbing down from the steps of the science lab in the seminary at St. Ben's. He wore the big habit and the big cape and everything. He was, he was old school. And he walked down as we'd be translating, doing our best to translate, you know, Cicero or whatever. And he stood over us. <laughs> he actually did say, this is Mr. Zogbe. And he's standing right over you. I mean, imagine that. You're trying to translate the ancient writers. And he says, Mr. Zogbe, trying to teach you Latin is like trying to nail jello to a tree. <laughs> 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 so the point is, is that Jerome is, is the first one who translated, which is very important for us because Jerome saw it as essential to translate the Bible into the language of the people, which is why when you go into any, um, is it, is it is Hilton or Marriott, uh, you go into the hotels in whatever country you go into, there's the Bible in that language. Because the, the Bible, of course, should be translated into the language of the people because it's the written word of God. Okay? Very good. 
So uh, the idea of looking at prefigure gates, eventually, let's see, where are we? I've only got just a few more minutes. Um, okay. What is about on page 11, dear ones? Oh, by the way, the, the, the type or figure, Mary is called the Queen Mother. It's because, as you see from the Old Testament in the ancient world, the Queen Mother was the one who sat next to the king, and the Queen Mother was the one who had the greatest influence with the king. Which, of course, the Queen Mother is the one who says, do whatever he tells you to do, in the first miracle of Cana. That's the first example of the intercession of Mary in the New Testament. Yeah, if, if the king has 400 wives, you don't make a wife. That's right. Yes, exactly. Precisely. You had so many wives, not one of the wives could be queen. But you only had one mother. Yeah, thank you, John. That's an awesome point. You had several wives. You couldn't have a queen be a wife because you had, you had so many wives. But, you know, monogamy was not necessarily part of the program. All right. You simply cannot understand Mary without looking at her through the first century Jewish context. And that's really important. So Dr. Petrie's reason for writing this book is found on the bottom of page uh, 11. This is what this book is about. We're going to go back and explore the Jewish roots of Mary, the Jewish scripture and the ancient Jewish tradition. The Old Testament will be the most important source of our understanding what the New Testament says about Mary. Because what? Every page of the New Testament is fulfilled, every page of the Old Testament is fulfilled in the New, but every page of the Old Testament has a prefigurement in the New Testament. Okay, so you can't understand the New Testament without the Old, or the Old Testament without the New. Uh, the sixth question. Outside of the Old Testament, what ancient Jewish sources does Dr. Peter use to help us to understand Mary? He will also quote writings outside the Bible to reflect Jewish traditions from the time of Jesus. Okay, and then he points out very nicely that <laughs> The, the stakes are pretty high, and it, I mean, it's it, again. I don't think there's any. There's so little antipathy. I mean, 30 years ago, I mean, there was so much, and maybe more even. There was so much like there was a lot of antipathy among Christians, but we're getting to be such a small group in America that we're actually understanding we're really on the same team. But it's important that either either we're right or wrong on this. Either we're right about Mary or we're wrong. And and so that's really the, the basic point that he's saying I'm gonna help us understand why why we're why we've been since the time of the apostles teaching the truth about Mary from both the Old and the New Testament. Okay. All right. Uh, from where does the Catholic Church get its teaching about Mary? Contrary to what some people teach, the Catholic Church did not get its teaching about Mary from paganism. He got it from Judaism. And we have one, we have one of my favorite priests, Professor All, I was telling David that we went to do a funeral uh, when we had time to talk. And I said, we have such great priests in the Archdiocese. And we really do. We have great priests. We're very, very blessed to have great priests. Um, but Father, my senior farmer, who was the Vicar General, and is two years behind me in school, and um, he is now pastor of Auburn, which is a great place. And um, so he says, you know, if I went to Catholic, he, he was a Baptist, and he converted to Catholic faith. He says, if I went to Catholic, I'd have to be a Jew. <laughs> he says, well, it's Jew the, the Jewish religion and the Catholic Church are the only ones founded by Jesus, or by God, I should say. So the point being, I mean, what, what we receive about Mary, we receive not as, you know, he points out, not, as, not from pagans, but from Jews. And as Pope Pius VI, Pope Paul VI said, Paul VI said, now St. Paul VI, he said, <laughs> we're all spiritually Semitic. I'm closer than y'all blood-wise, y'all white people. <laughs> I'm close to y'all white people are. But, but, but relative to blood, I am. But we, we're all spiritually Semitic. 
Because our Savior was a Jew. Our Savior was a Jew. And so to, to understand our faith, we have to understand the Jewish faith. But I'll be honest with you, I'm so delighted that he's writing these books because it's really teaching me a lot. If we come to understand Mary better, who is it that will really come to understand better? Jesus. Jesus. And that's really what we hope to do. We come to understand Jesus uh, better. So that we can, it, and it's not about understanding Jesus. He's in some ways incomprehensible, except that he told us all about himself. We have four Gospels. And we serve him as our Lord. So if we come to understand anything about Mary, everything we come to understand about Mary is going to be a reflection upon what we believe about Jesus as our Savior and our Lord. Okay. What, what questions do y'all have? Anything? Yes? Oh. Great question. Uh, did Mary have any other children? Again, thank you for asking that question, Barbara. Mary did not have other children uh, because of her singular vocation to be the mother of Jesus, who is the mother of God. And because she was impregnated by the Holy Spirit, so it was clear to her and St. Joseph that the church would teach she has perpetual virginity. And what do we do with the scripture? You, your brother and your mother, your brothers and sisters are, are waiting outside of your mother. Um, so it, it's, it's really, it's an apostolic teaching, meaning the, ch the Catholic Church has never taught anything other than she had no other children, biologically. But this is important. Um, why? Because of her singular vocation. But what do we do with brothers and sisters? I have, I have learned to tell you, the word for the word for mom and dad and brothers and sisters, mom and dad, brothers and sisters, aunts and uncles and cousins is this word in Italian, parenti. Parenti. It comes from the word parent, doesn't it? Or, I mean, we get the word parent from it. In Spanish, it's familiares. 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 Parientes. Oh, that's true. You have that word too, parientes. Thank you. Welcome home. Parientes. And that's right. So you have the same word. Okay, so the point being, and, and it's, it's, it's Spanish is another interesting language. You call your first cousin your primo hermano, your cousin brother, because you're so closely related. So, and, and, and clearly we understand that when I say brothers and sisters, I'm not blood related to you. Or in common parlance, as I've taught you before in some form or fashion, what's up, bro? What's up, bro? I'm not related to you, but I call you bro. You know, bring it in. <laughs> so point being, yeah, the church has never known, taught, or believed that Mary had other children, but the brothers and sisters that the scriptures speak about, we truly believe, and have always believed, are his relatives, or those who follow him closely. Because I call you brothers and sisters as well. Okay. Yes, Carol? Another question. And he'll get to all of these questions, by the way, little by little. Yes. What is the Jewish faith uh, teaching about Mary? We're saying that the, all the information comes from the Jewish typology. Good. So the Jewish faith does not teach about Mary, to my knowledge, because the Jewish people, as they are, are waiting for the Messiah. Okay? But the typology, the the, pre, the prefigurements, the typology, the, the what Mary will be are found in its antecedent form in the Old Testament. It's a matter of typology or what the, what the Old Testament teaches, he's going to point out various titles of Mary and teachings about Mary are actually found in their antecedent form in the Old Testament. The Jewish religion, to my knowledge, doesn't teach about Mary, although I'm not an expert in Judaism. But I wouldn't think they do. But what he's saying is, is that the Old Testament prefigures what the church teaches about Mary. And that we can only understand Mary if we come to understand the Old Testament better. Excellent question. Yes, John? Yes, yes. Right. 
Yes. So, so she she is prefigured of Ezekiel. Now we're going to find that you're, this will all. It's kind of like in, in RCIA. It's so funny. People say I come in. I came in with a thousand questions, and I didn't have to answer one. I didn't have to ask one because all of the answers were given. I think we'll find that many of these questions that we're asking now will be answered, uh, and, and just little by little. So continue to come, you stinkers. <laughs> okay. All right, everybody. Let's pray. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and the Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Have a great night.